I'm coming off a where it but um, bear with me. I got my Kleenexes. Started with Roxanne last Sunday, who disappeared from the service and ended up on the couch of the youth room. I did everything to keep from her, which isn't easy because, you know, our love is so close. And she, uh, and she still gave it to me somehow. Go figure. We share everything, right? So, um, so I got it Tuesday night, and uh, there we go. Um, but I think we'll be good. Bless you, Mo. That was uh, that was great praise. You know, I I saw Kay in the hallway, right out here last Sunday, and uh, following Ken's vibrant message, I. Um, I had her on my heart, and, and Rob, and Ken Greenhoe, and, and just so many others, and just so many saints in this congregation, and the perseverance of so many who have gone through so much for so many years. And, and I had toyed with Romans 12.12, 12 and, and I showed it to her, and I said, you know, I, I'm going to do 12.12 12 next week. Um, and... Um, and I, I decided I'm just going to stick with it. And uh, I, I had no idea where the Lord was going to take me with that um, until late last night, kind of. I mean, it took a while to kind of figure out where the Lord was going to take me with it. But, but, um, but it's amazing because Romans is an amazing place to be. And... Uh, and it took me down paths, and it took me down uh, some personal paths, too. So I'm sure we can all relate. The, the section that we're in uh, just happens to be called Love in Action. So, so I, I titled this Love in Action. But it's interesting because it, there's a lot more love involved in, in this scripture than we might even kind of think on the surface. We might think it's a lot about prayer, and it is. It's about a lot of things. It's... It's actually so deep, we could go anywhere. And I'm not going to unpack this thing really deep. But um, anyway, but that's where we're going to go. Uh, the verse is, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. And since Rome wasn't built in a day, I'm going to take my time getting to it, okay? But I'll still get you out of here. A little context for the book that we'll be in, uh, certainly one of Paul's epistles, one of his letters. Um, but I'm going to give you an idea of what was going on in Rome uh, at the time, uh, at least with regards to the emperor. And you talk about the world, and we do this often, the world is just chaotic. The world is, is, uh, is a mess. We, we, we use that term a lot out here. Well, it's been a mess for a long time. It's always been a mess. It always will be a mess. Let, we just need to get used to that. I find it interesting. You know, um, Jesus has that expectation that we're going to hopefully reach through that permeate through that. Paul did a good job of that, right? Um, of, of kind of being in the world without being of the world. And, uh, um, but the, the emperorship, if that's a term, was absolutely a mess in Rome. Um, and I'll give you an indication. It was fairly peaceful at the time that Paul uh, did write his letter to uh, to Rome, but um, to give you just an indication of how messed up that was over there, um, it would be peaceful for there for a while. There was a, a great Roman fire later that would uh, create, uh, they would make scapegoats out of the Christians and create some mess. But at 15, Nero married his stepsister Claudia Octavia. At 16, he inherited the throne when his uncle and some say his father died from being poisoned with mushrooms by his mother, Agrippina the Younger. At 18, uh, he apparently poisoned or had his uh, stepbrother, Britannicus, poisoned. Uh, kind of get him out of the way of the, being in the way of his uh, throne. 
Britannicus hadn't quite reached his 14th birthday. Soon after, Nero expelled his mother from Rome, clearly paranoia. At 22, he had her assassinated, and the paranoia problem was fixed. And, and he's the nephew of the Emperor Caligula, who you might have heard about. Uh, this is a guy who received worship as the living God and planned to make his horse a senator. Uh, at least he attempted, had that plan, didn't happen. So what's the old adage, do as the Romans do? Yeah, not in that case, right? So that was going on in Rome. Now Paul's frame of mind in writing Romans, he was in Corinth at the time. And uh, Corinth was a prominent bustling city full of much diversity of people and religious beliefs, pretty similar to what we would see anywhere around us, right? Uh, he had come across many people living the kinds of lives he warns against in, uh, in the early chapters of Romans. And he speaks of idolatry and harmful practices of pagan religions. He uh, uses specific examples which he could have come across in Corinth or any of his visits through the course of his missionary journeys. Now, what's interesting with this one is Paul's letters were to churches which he had familiarity. But not so with Rome. Paul hadn't been to Rome. He had planned to go to Rome on his way to Spain. And he knew some people, he knew believers who had come from Rome and visited with him, in fact, even in, in Corinth. But this was going to be a letter that he was going to send to the believers in Rome where he had not yet been. And he needed to be handwritten. And I find this so interesting. Because when you think of Paul, some of the statements that Paul had made, would you expect Paul to send a man or a woman with this all-important mission of hand-delivering this letter? A letter that's not just about uh, providing um, responses to specific issues going on within the church, but this is going to literally can, can carry or contain the context of Christian life, the foundation, the doctrine of our, of our Christian life, right? A woman. I'm amazed by that. And it was Phoebe, an important member of the church at St. Creae, Port City in Corinth. Um, now, he already knew her. Um, he, had, uh, he had visited with her. He knew her um, from journeying, uh, that she was going to be journeying to Rome. So he took advantage of that opportunity. And, um, <coughs> and he knew that she had an important role uh, in her church. Um, so she was trusted. And trusted in a couple ways. Um, it's interesting because this, this letter, uh, Romans, closes with, to the love and care of the believers gathered to the name of the Lord Jesus in Rome. And in that closing section mentions 26 individuals by name. So even though he, he hasn't been there, he's very careful to name drop all of the people he does know who's there. Paul, very good at personalizing his, to his audience as much as possible. We need to pay attention to that. Um, but imagine being Phoebe. Imagine receiving a letter and, and then being there and hearing it read out loud for the first time. And knowing that the members of that community were going to be so full of questions. And she was going to be the one who's going to be able to uh, answer them and explain what Paul meant. Um, because she had first-hand knowledge of his message and experience of serving the gospel alongside him as a co-worker. So she was the first interpreter of Paul's letter to the Romans. So I just wanted to share that. You know, it's not Mother's Day, but I think it's awesome for the women in the congregation to be aware of that, because sometimes Paul said some things that we avoid. So turn to Romans 12 with me, if you can. And... Romans 12 opens with the first word, which is like this major hook. It's one of those words that says, like when I'm teaching Sunday school, I like to say, when you're reading a scripture, make sure that you understand the context of what comes before it and what comes after it. Well, here we have the word, therefore. Right, 12.1, therefore, comma, conjunctive adverb. Well, what that tells us is that we really need to know everything that was in the first 11 chapters. Yeah, there you go. Good luck, youth group. 
Uh, and, and we're not going to go there. Uh, but we do know that chapters 1 through 3, we've got the, the, the humans lacking God's righteousness because of sin. We've got chapters 4 and 5, the justification uh, that we have through faith, and, and so on, all the way up through 11. Now, many of us grew up with Romans Road, right? Road to salvation. So we've been all through, I mean, the book of Romans is so rich. And then when we get to 12 and on, now we're into the life application stuff. So this is really, really good stuff. Verse 1, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And then what does it say? Basically, don't conform, be transformed. Living sacrifice. I don't need to go to Doug Armock anymore and ask for a goat or some chickens or some doves. I don't need to do that. You know, He thinks I'm asking for him for pets. No, you know, trying to find an altar somewhere. So this is the powerful stuff, the living sacrifice. This is us. Why? Because who's our example, right? Did we rebuild the temple in three days? Yeah, here we are, the new high priest. All right, so let's move down to chapter 9. And this is where we're in 12, chapter 9, in Romans, verse 9. I'm going to drop down to verse 9. And I'm dropping down to love in action. You know, I would have gone there immediately, except it's so hard to pass Romans 1 and 2. It just is. You know, in fact, when I went to pass through it, I just felt the Holy Spirit push me back and say, you've got a poster in the youth room that says normal's not enough. You know, we've been to Acquire the Fire in the youth group so many times, and that was one of the most amazing Acquire the Fires. I think we had 12, 14, 16 kids go to that, that youth group, and it was all about that. Don't conform, be transformed. Normal is not enough. I'll never forget that. It was one of the most powerful events that we had ever gone to. I could, I could spend a whole Sunday on that. Um, so here's what Paul's saying. Love must be sincere. And he means undisguised, transparent, not hypocritical. Hate what is evil, corrupt, perverse, hurtful. Cling to what is good, upright, joyful, beneficial. Verse 10, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Not easy. Verse 11, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. I love, I love that. I love like this morning. I love what Ken was doing this morning. That's exactly what we're talking about. I, I use the metaphor sometimes with Mason. Mason and I use a term a lot, or he doesn't. I do. I don't know. He probably doesn't even want to hear it. But I tell Mason a lot, to, he, it's time to pop off. It's time to pop off. I'll even do this. I'll do the image. When he's down on the field, he looks up at me, because he, he looks. He wants to see if Dad's in the stands, and I'll do this. And he knows what that means. And then he gets out there on the, on the pitch, on the field, and a soccer game, and boom, he's flying down the touchline, and he's... But you know, hey, it's time. It's time to pop off. And, and do we do that? We do that in our lives when we do things that we're excited about, hobbies and events and, and things that we're really all excited about in here. Spiritually, do we still match up with that? Right? So God's saying, hey, give me all, you're all. I see you doing all of that. Maybe even in your marriage. That's great, but I don't think I've ever heard Jesus ask me to pop off with, with my spiritual life. But, but we do. We, we want to be, uh, have spiritual fervor serving the Lord. And that's joy. And that leads us into, not surprisingly, our scripture. And here's why, here's why that should get us kind of amplified at this point because the scripture gives us these three staccato statements these short little statements and Paul didn't always talk this way in fact sometimes when I'm reading Paul I have some difficulty when I'm kind of reading through some of, some of uh, his writing but here he goes boom 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 be joyful in hope be patient in affliction be faithful in prayer I love this 
The beauty of presenting it that way is it gives us clarity, fluid reading, and emphasis. Three prayers, three promises, three purposes for Christian life. And let's look at each of those three. Joyful in hope. Now, I was talking to the youth group a couple of weeks ago, and I said, so what, what do you hope for? And I had some really good responses. Nikki had a profound, I mean, within a second, she, she responded with a profound hope. And I love that. I love when the teens are just, just, it's right there. And, and in our world, we think of down, you know, when we're out in the world, we think about hope. It's, it's almost like a wish, right? Rob, I hope the Lions win the Super Bowl. I mean, no. Um, but that's how hope is down here, right? But, but, but often, this world and the spiritual world are often flipped on their head, aren't they? And so the hope here is not a hope that's wished for. It's an expectation. The Greek word elpis means expectation. It's an expectation. We put our hope in it because we know, we trust. It's a hope that it's going to be. I am joyful in that. I'm joyful in the truth of Jesus Christ. That's a different kind of hope. That's not something I'm wishing for when maybe I've got my fingers crossed behind my back. It's not that. No, that's something I'm going to drop on my knees and say, I'm humbling myself because I, I, I don't get what happened here, but I'm not worthy for this, but whew, bigger than me. So the first command is hope. The second command is Patient. Patient in affliction, patient in tribulation, patient in trouble. And the word patient here means stay behind, abide, remain, stay the course. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I was up here talking about the Holy Spirit and the Comforter coming alongside, Paracletos. I want to share, share a little bit with you here. A lot of times when we're weathering trouble, or weathering disappointment. And we think, well, it's because we, we can't see through the clouds and it, maybe God's got a better purpose for us because he can see past that. Right? I'm in the storm, I can't see past the storm and, and I'm going to have to trust God through the storm. But a lot of times we can. We, we can see it. We just need God to get us through it past it. Paul had the thorn in his flesh. He's like, hey, I... He's praying. Three times he prayed for the thorn to be removed. It wasn't going to happen. Because there was going to be a glorification in spite of that. Well, it's kind of my story. I was downstate and I was sitting at Denny's at Long Lake and Woodward in Bloomfield, if you've ever been down there. I don't know if it's still there. This is years ago. And it was my performance review. My supervisor's there and he's Starting to do it, read it to me, and I was feeling pretty good. I was feeling pretty good about it. And, uh, and he says, you know, very good, excellent, very good. And he starts to go through it, and he finally just, and I can see something's wrong. And he just kind of picks it up, and he tosses it to me, and he, he says, John, here you go. He goes, you know what, um, it, it's all really, really good. Just go ahead and read it. If you have any questions or comments to each of the things, just make, a, make the notes, and then you can sign it. And I thought, well, there's a letdown. Got myself all ready for this. And I said, what, what's wrong? And he said, well, because of the merger and some of the other things, if we, you're the, you know, you're the low seniority on the account, account executive, if we don't lose somebody, you know, within a few months, I, I don't know if we're going to be able to. Well, there's a gut punch. Thanks for the performance review. And then I understood his disposition sitting across from me. 
And, and all I could think when I walked out of there, I, I remember going back to my office and thinking, wait, this is the very office that that, that night, in the dark, while I'm typing a report for General Motors, and, I, and my fingers were soaking wet, and I looked up, and because I, I couldn't figure out why my fingers were wet, and the keyboard was wet, and I looked up, and tears were falling down, and I looked at my computer, and I was looking at sin in the report. I'm looking at sin. Oh, wait, those are my sins. Oh, boy. Don't hit send. And, and I scroll back. Remember I said I like numbers? I'm into no You wonder why some of these things are? It's because they are entrenched in my heart. Because I'm right, I go back seven pages of report to General Motors. GM Parts was my client. Seven pages and with no transition, none whatsoever, no conjunctive adverb, seven pages of confession. There it was. It just went boom. 14 pages of a report that won't, what never got sent. And, and I was crying, I was bawling. I was only in my office, only by the light of the monitor. The sun had gone down the window, so I didn't have an overhead light on. And I got up from my desk, I'd gone around, I got on my knees, and I just said, Jesus, strip it away. Just strip this all away. I, 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 at that period of time, I just didn't need God as much as I thought I did. And had really just, all of a sudden... Holy Spirit just brought me right back. Amen. And there's more of that testimony, but there's not time. So I, anyway, that's where I was, in the dark, rocking back and forth, crying, saying, strip it away. Lord, Lord, just take me, take me. Hand, I'm handing it all over, and no kidding here, the door opens up, the light switches on. I hadn't noticed the vacuum cleaners had been going. It's the housekeeper. And she looks at me, freaks out, because I'm on the floor rocking back and forth on my knees like I'm having an OD. And she turns the light off, shuts it, goes, sorry, shuts the light off, shuts the door, she leaves. And I start laughing so hard. True story. I'm laughing so hard, rocking back and forth. And in that moment, I realized I wasn't rocking alone as I'm laughing. And I wasn't even laughing alone. I felt the presence of somebody literally having joy with me. Somebody... Like, like literally alongside me. I didn't feel, I didn't feel like not touching or whatever. Can't, I can't describe it to you. But if you wonder why when I talk about the Holy Spirit and I talk about parakletos or parakletos, come alongside, why it means something to me, because I lived that that day in my office and I felt the joy of Jesus in my office. And I've got my supervisor looking across me saying, sorry, not your plan. And I'm asking God, how is this not my plan? It was you and I, buddy, right there in my office. I thought, well, maybe, maybe I'll apply to other agencies. Well, all the agencies were automotive related. So what does that mean? No matter where I go, it's going to be jumping off the Hindenburg onto the Titanic. None of it's going to work. So out of the blue, my brother calls, and he says, hey, I'm, he's up in Gaylord with my parents. i got a great opportunity to resort, sales and marketing director. Owner wants to talk to you. I'll try it. Go up there for a couple years. Let the dust settle. Of course, I never went back. Who do I meet when I move up north? I meet my wife. Now, at that time, I wasn't ready to settle down. I didn't think I'd find the right girl. I mean, who's going who's gonna, to who's gonna line up with me, right? <laughs> Roxanne took pity. But an important thing uh, in, in this suddenly happened. I got up there, and all of a sudden, my mom took ill. And suddenly, I'm not 200 and some miles away. I'm right in their backyard. And their finances became difficult. And I was single, doing pretty well. And my brother was helping them, and I was helping them, and we were able to be there, right there. And then the resort went through some stuff, and I took a management contract for a couple years in Traverse City. We're married now. We moved to Traverse City, and they find a little bit of cancer in my mom's spine. They think that's all it is, just a little bit of something. So they're going to give her some treatments in Traverse City, and 
boom, 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 within a couple days, she's in ER. I happen to be right in Traverse City. Who, who could have ever seen that happening? I didn't plan that out. And I get to be with mom in her final days. Roxanne, too. You know, it's, it's an amazing journey that when I go all the way back to that Denny's and that performance review, I never could have seen any of this all the way out. And if you had told me at that time, if, if my supervisor had said, John, hey, everything's going to work out. You'll be up north, and you'll be working with the homeless population, and you'll be, I'd, I'd be going, wait, what? None of that makes any sense. Not that I wouldn't want to help and, and do those things, but oh yeah, you'll be helping veterans, and well, that sounds awesome. But that's not who I am, that's not what I do. Well, you know what, it's God's will. And you're gonna end up loving it, and I do. But most importantly, it wasn't about my life. It was about the other people for me to be a part of. So when I talk about that second section, patient, it's really important that we refer to, when we talk about stay the course, be patient, stay behind, remain, think about others too. When we are staying behind, when we are abiding with others who are in trouble, others who are in tribulation, when we are walking alongside them, we are giving them love. Second command here, I'm going to say, is about love. And the third one is faithful. Faithful in prayer. Continuing, persevering, constant readiness in prayer. You notice sometimes we, we might stop praying because we're not getting the outcome we want. We don't see it. Or here's the other one. We get the outcome, so we stop praying. Here's the alert. Bob's in the hospital. Start praying for Bob. Oh, Bob's been released from the hospital. Check it off. Don't need to pray for Bob. Oh, Bob was rushed back to the hospital. Bob, you're back on my list. I'm not saying that's what we're doing. But this is saying it's not about that. Bob should already be a thread a consistent theme for you. Bob should already be on your heart. You shouldn't wait for that email. And, and Luke tells us Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Distractions are so hard. I, I have to be so methodical and diligent, deliberate and intentional terms I love to use. If I'm in my office, it's just bizarre what I have to do to be honest with myself and my savior. Door shut, lights off. Fit, there's just physical things I have to do. I have to create space. I almost like literally have to create my own like planetarium so I can just get everything away because there's so easy for distractions to stop me from my prayer. And it is for all of us, right? Not just because we're busy, it's just, look at Gethsemane with Jesus. You don't think that there's an attack going on? There is. I don't see Megan Ellis here today. She's been coming, by the way. Praise God. But, but Megan and I, when we would take the kids to acquire the fire, it happened all the time when we'd get ready to take the kids on the road. All the time. I can't tell Just the most bizarre things would be happening. So you look at the three. Hope, love, faith. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And now these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close us into uh, John, the book of John. But, you know, Paul was a former Pharisee. And there's a, the word for love in Hebrew is ahava. It's a beautiful word. I love that. Ahava, to love. It's used referring to Abraham's love for Isaac and Jacob loving Rachel so much that Seven more years working for Laban seemed like a few days. Now the root is hav, because ah, hav, ah. 
Um, that root hav means to give. Love is a verb. Love in action. Love is doing for someone else. It's not a feeling. That would be for self. And that's when we get caught up in what? Sin. When we tarry, that is wait, stay behind, come alongside, someone else in trouble, the second command, we're showing what? Love. And whose example is that? Jesus. You know, I was going to close with John 16 because we're approaching Easter. I think this is a good transition. But I'm going to, these are just a couple of verses real quick. Um, John 14, 25. You know, a couple of weeks ago when sharing about Pastor John and the brief message uh, on the Holy Spirit, um, with all that had happened in the, the news and, and, and how quickly it came, um, you know, that message was, was severely truncated, and understandably so. Um, but this was, the last, this was the last verse, but it, it applies here. And it really helps us sandwich that expectation of be joyful in hope and the expectation of continual prayer and those expectations, almost like a sandwich pushing up, pushing up and supporting the patient and affliction, that love. He says, all this I have spoken while with you, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Expectation. Promise, hope, truth. Take it to the bank. In John 16, still in the upper room, they've been there for five chapters of John, right? 13 through 17. They don't have joy and hope at that point, do they? Because we know how it ends. Jesus has been predicting his death, advising them the world is going to be hating them, possible persecution. Disciples are all searching for meaning and purpose. They're uncertain, they're confused. They didn't want him to die. And he's talking about dying, rising, leaving. But he closes with this. Do you now believe, Jesus replied, because they had shared, we get it. We know where you came from. A time is coming and in fact has come when you'll all be scattered, each to your own home. You'll leave me all alone. Yet I'm not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things so that with me you may have peace. And then perhaps the most powerful line that sometimes brings me to tears. Let's take heart to this over the next few weeks as Easter approaches and as we consider the suffering that our Savior went through. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome it. Praise God. That's what allows us to be joyful in hope. That's what allows us to be patient in our affliction. That's what allows us to be faithful in our prayer. That is the example that he set for us, and that is the example that we can set not only for ourselves, for our congregation, but to a hurting world outside that doesn't know him and makes everything that he did on the cross so worthwhile. Thank you.